Well, my name is uh, Charles Hopkins, and uh, I hold the UNESCO Chair on Reorienting Education Towards Sustainability at York University in Toronto, Canada. I've been involved in environmental education, outdoor education, experiential education, and education for sustainable development throughout my, uh, my entire career. In the 1960s, I uh, was teaching uh, outdoor education. In the uh, 70s, I was a school principal. In the 80s, I became a superintendent, a regional superintendent of schools. And in the, uh, the mid-90s, I was superintendent of curriculum for Canada's largest education system, the Toronto Board of Education at the time. But through it all, the, the concern uh, was balanced between what the students needed and what society felt the students needed. You know, they, uh, in the beginning, I guess I was so concerned about the environment and uh, how, to, how to reach students with those kinds of concerns and so on. But when I became a, a superintendent of curriculum, I realized that there was a much, uh, uh, there was even a greater need of how do we balance these things, how do we put them in perspective. They do need uh, to be employed. When one looks at the well-being of the individual and balance that with the well-being of society, uh, it becomes very, very uh, complex. So what I'd like to do is maybe just talk a little bit about the journey and uh, where, what I'm doing now and, and where, uh, where I need to go. So as I say, I began as a teacher, principal, school superintendent. And uh, <clears throat> through it all, this underlying concern about the future of the planet as well as the well-being of people. And by well-being, I don't mean well-off. Uh, the whole concept of, of well-being is, is very, very complex. You know, being able to cope with your birth lottery. Where were you born? Parents, your physical features, the color of your skin. Uh, these uh, sort of shape the beginning and how well you cope with this. As, as you move forward. The idea of well-being in, includes meaningfulness in one's life. Right? It, 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 how you, uh, your employability, your ability to relate to others and so on. It's very complex. And what is the role of education in doing this? So the different stages where you begin with having people uh, young, young people um, loving to learn, just the exposure. And how do you keep that love of learning throughout one's entire life? And then what is there to learn? And um, exploring and so on, and then eventually getting into how to learn. And then the, the important thing we don't do very well in North America, at any rate, is shifting the responsibility from teaching to learning. It's shifting the responsibility to the learner to become a lifelong learner. You know, I can remember so many of my colleagues in high school saying, oh God, just let me get to grade 10 and then it's over. You know, I, I never want to be uh, learning again in school and so on. But it's a very different world now. So all of this is an influence in, into what it is that students need to know, what does an educated society need to know, you know, and balancing that with the curriculum and what we, we think and try to impose on them. So it, it's that, that whole balance. At any rate, um, for a while I was the principal of Canada's largest field study center. We slept 200 in week long. It was a residential program. We had faculty that we were able to pull together from around the world. 
It was called the Boyne River Natural Science School, and, and uh, those were some of my, my happiest days. But uh, as we were going along through that, I, uh, the, the concept that teaching in the outdoors, that is outdoor education, where I came from, that had emerged sort of out of natural history studies, we had outdoor edu education in the outdoors, and then a wonderful Bill Stapp, who is a colleague and, and, and uh, sort of a lifelong friend, sort of pushed forward the idea that it, l learning in the outdoors wasn't quite enough. We needed to learn for the outdoors, and the four became an, an important aspect. And so, as the world was trying to figure out what is environmental education, uh, I led the Canadian team to the, the uh, UN regional network in, in Helsinki in Finland as we were trying to struggle with what is environmental education, what should it do, what, what is its purpose and so on. This was in, in the 70s coming out uh, from the, the Stockholm conference. So I was involved in all of that but then as I learned we could push for the en environmental education, but on a global basis that I began working on. You know, two thirds of the world were living in poverty. You know, 40, in, in fact, in those days, 40% of the people were living in, in poverty in the developing countries. You know, the developing countries really are the former colonies that were set free. That, that's where the developing countries came from, is the European countries set them free without any real resources or funding and they had to struggle on their own. These people wanted environmental protection, but number one, they needed to get out of poverty. It's not as though they didn't care for their environment or love their environment. No, they did but they were forced into abject poverty and shortages and so on. So they needed development. And so we saw that and in the 1980s there was this how do we, how do we deal with the need for development but development that wouldn't trash the planet. That was the huge objective and of course you all know the story, our common future, grow Harlem Brundtland, Traveled the world. I actually had the opportunity to present my ideas to Brundtland here in, in Ottawa, in Canada. And uh, out of that consultation around the world was that, that saw off. The best we could do in the 1980s, you know, we, we had many dictators around the world, we had oligarchs, we had whatever. But to get the world leaders to buy into some sort of overarching framework, the best we could do was to come up with something that said, yes, development, we need that, but development that is sustainable. Development that met the needs, not the greeds as Gandhi says, you know, met the needs of the current generation without impinging or limiting future generations for meeting theirs. So, we came up with the concept of, of sustainable development, but what does that really mean? And it was pretty fuzzy. You know, sustaining what? And the current inequities in the world, or, or for whom? You know, there were, there were these, these questions. Of course, the corporate world um, was very concerned about it all, but they were told, look, it's really just eco-efficiency. I was part of all, all of this. It, it was a wonderful time. Um, saying, you're just going to, you, you'll, you'll save on, on your resources, you'll cut down your waste stream, save energy, water, and so on. It, it's, it's okay. Now, of course, it was much deeper than that. But that is the way in which we could at least bring the corporate world to the, to the table. But we had to come up with an implementation plan. So between 1987 and 1992, there were negotiations going on around the world and uh, coming up with an implementation plan. We've had three implementation plans. That first one went from 1992 to 2000. It was called Agenda 21. And it was within that, uh, that first implementation plan, that education was agreed upon, it was unanimous. 
and uh, the role of education, public awareness and understanding, and training. Those, those three things that later became to be referred to as education for sustainable development. Okay? That's, that was its birth there. The second uh, implementation plan was from 2000 to 2015, the Millennium Development Goals, and now we're into the 2030 agenda. And this is the third implementation plan, and I assume there will be a fourth. It, it doesn't look uh, like we've solved all the world's problems by 2030. So there will probably be something from 2030 to 2050. And of course, once again, education, public awareness and training uh, have to be there. They need to be in it. Let me g just give you a little side story. When we were, I happened to be one of, there were about 10 of us that wrote the chapter on the, what is education for sustainable development. Education, public awareness and training it was called. We met several times uh, and uh, there were representatives from the private sector, the elementary and secondary education, uh, higher education, uh, UN agencies, UNESCO, UNEP, um, World Conservation Authority, etc. But we're having a discussion and one of the ones that jumped out in my mind was a, a, um, a university president from North America said, what we really need is better recycling. If we can really do recycling well, that should solve it. And the Dean of the Faculty of Education of the University of Cairo smiled, looked at him and said, I have 300,000 children who are very, very good at recycling. Yeah. He was talking about the children who lived in the dumps of Cairo. He said, they're very good at recycling. They need an education. And that shifted the whole concept of what we were talking about. Because education for sustainable development does include appropriate development. And so the first thing that we agreed upon was education for sustainable development needed to address access and retention in quality education. It was, it was very, very different than trying to tweak our existing education systems. Right? So that became the first of the four thrusts was access and retention. And we could discuss what is quality education. And that is critical then, it's critical now, and will continue to be critical as education shifts and change and the roles and responsibilities and so on come forward. But the second thing, the second thrust was recognizing it was our most educated countries that were creating the deepest ecological problems in many cases. What we had to do was to reorient the purpose of our existing education systems at all levels, preschool through, especially in higher education, and, and I'll, I'll come back to that. But this, the whole thing wasn't you know, yes, there are some core teachings that we need to bring in, but the reorienting had to start with the very purpose of why we are educating people to include a sustainable future had to be seen as a purpose of education. Now, the third one was public awareness and understanding, because, you know, we don't really control our education systems on our own. This is mandated by governments, the curriculum are laid down, and they can only go so far without the support of the general public. You know, now when you try to bring in any kind of major education change, you get it in a bit and then there's the whiplash back to math and language. You know, what's our PISA score? And, and that sort of it. I'm not against math and language. They are tools. The important tools, and they should be sharp, they should be good, but they're tools. They're not the purpose of education. 
the purpose, what do we do with these tools? We need that. So public awareness and understanding and support. And then the fourth one is training, where we do know how to do things better, whether it's operate sewage treatment plants or build better automobiles or, or, or whatever around the household. You know, the, the training aspect is separate and it's, it's extremely important. It, even included in that is the training of higher education faculties, you know, which uh, takes a very, very different skill. The old line, you can always uh, tell a university professor, but you can't tell them much, right? So you have to have different ways of approaching, but uh, I digress. But those four things are extremely important in trying to, uh, to understand it. So coming out of 1992 with Agenda 21, the four thrusts, UNESCO was asked to lead a global uh, initiative with the other UN agencies to try and, and build support for countries in, in, in moving forward. And uh, one of the first things they had to do was to come up with a conceptual framework. So the importance of how would this be different? Because initially people were thinking, well, if uh, we have environmental education, uh, we have outdoor education, uh, by then we had experiential education, learning from the environment as well as in and for uh, and, and about the environment from natural history education, conservation education. So we had, we had that, but what really was different? And part of that difference was access and retention in quality education. That education for all had, had to be an important component of it. So in the, the first program that UNESCO came up with, uh, in order to get the funds, they took funds from population education. It was called EPD. And, uh, environment, population, and development. And, and we, I happen to be part of, of all that. The idea was settling on a name. And eventually, we, we, we came up with education for sustainable development. It had, it had to have a global thing, and we had to have the word for in for a purpose, which has drawn some criticism. Criticism that if you educate for, then it's, it could be indoctrination. But just as we agreed that environmental education was education for the environment, we said, look, all education is with purpose. You know, let, let, let's be honest, right? All education comes forward with a twist and a purpose and so on. And so the, the idea of, uh, of it being education for sustainable development, not sustainability education. Because we wanted to move away. One of the great environmental educators, John Smythe from Scotland, he came out with the concept of adjectival education, where ever you put an adjective in front of the word education, peace education, driver education, drug education, so on. Was all, I have a list of 80 of them when I was school superintendent and superintendent of curriculum. Every two weeks, someone came in with a binder and said, just put this in the curriculum. And, uh, <clears throat> but it, there is a very different concept of taking existing education and trying to stuff some or infuse something into it. And, and teachers are saying, look, all we measure really are math, language, and science. And, uh, you know, these other things are nice, etc. So what we wanted to do, and it becomes very difficult when you have an adjectival education, bringing it into higher education, because you will only attract those who take the course. Right? So what we wanted to do was to transform education. And we're calling for that now, again. That was the, uh, 1990. Now again, the whole UN is calling for the transformation of education. We're not very good at it. You know, and, and if I have time, I'll come back to that. But <clears throat> the idea then was to use all of education, preschool to postgraduate, you know, and uh, 
postdoctoral, whatever, you, using all of, uh, of the concept of, of education, transforming it, reorient, and engaging that in trying to build a more sustainable future. So that, that was important as to what we call it. But most people, including ministers of education, people around, and uh, those who shape education, those in faculties of education and so on, could not really get their, their minds around the idea of changing the world's education system. And so most look at it as what parts of sustainability can we put in? Is it biodiversity education? Um, is it something uh, around climate change? You know, let's, let's put that in. There is the, uh, in what is often left out, is all the whole social justice. You know, the, the equity. It, it's, remember, sustainable development itself, which, on, on which we build education for sustainable development. Right? It is about balancing social justice, economic justice, and uh, environmental justice. All of these aspects are, are, are trying to sort out the, how they are interwoven and touching upon one works on something else. So that, that is a, an extremely Im important part. The realization though, that no one can do it all. This is what pulls us back. So each of us, has something that is both our passion and our knowledge and what we can contribute. The problem is how do we pull this disparate parts together and put them there in a way that the learner wants to absorb it, right? So that, that is, is a huge challenge. Because we know environmental educators and outdoor educators were the ones who realized that simply telling people something really doesn't necessarily bring about a change. I think we probably learned that from the smokers and uh, the, you know, we all know what we shouldn't eat and what we shouldn't do. You know, that, that's kind of common knowledge. However, bringing about change. So the whole idea of moving beyond the natural sciences and engaging the social sciences in, in, in what we're trying to do to better understand how do we bring about this kind of, of transformation is extremely important. So what we sort of moved to was what we call the whole school approach. It's not just what we teach, it's also what we examine. If it's not on the examination, then it's not important. It's something we do Friday afternoon, right? So it's, it's what we teach and what we value enough to examine and report upon. In higher education, it's what we research. It's what becomes an important element of our community service. And of course, at the bottom line is what do we model? whether it's preschool or university. Is this what we simply talk about? Or is it part of our DNA? You know, higher education, my university is 55,000 students. It's like a town. And we can, we can monitor our total water consumption, our energy use. We should be a living laboratory and modeling and moving forward in the whole thing. And that's what our universities are starting to do. As we now around the world, there are about 1,700 universities that are standing up and to be evaluated, to be ranked on their impact around sustainability because they see that their contribution to the world is extremely important. But how do you transform a whole university? Uh, and and I, I harp on universities because it's such, globally at such a small percentage, it's about 8% of the world's population will graduate from a university. But they'll become 
of the shapers of the world. You know, not only in the private sector, the public sector, our writers, our philosophers, our thinkers. You know, they they will become our faith-based leaders. You know, so the artists and so on. So it's extremely important that higher education realize its social commitment. Most universities are paid for out of the public trust. Right? So they have a social responsibility. But how do we bring that into the mind of the student who has paid their money and, uh, you know, and, and it's about me and we need to start thinking about we, you know, the commitment. But how do we do that transformation? And UNESCO now, um, we're struggling with the idea of, of several steps. The first step is knowing and understanding what, what the issue is, what's causing climate change or social injustice and so on. It, it's knowing it. The second thing, though, is, is experiencing it. You know, because at some point, we need to, to develop compassion. So hearing about it, becoming engaged in doing it, and, and building the compassion, knowing the people, knowing that you can actually make an impact, is, is how to try and, and bring this, uh, this kind of knowledgeable, compassionate engagement. Is, is the direction we're going. And we've known that from environmental education for years. Right? We're also bringing in indigenous ways of knowing and, and, and learning from the land, learning for the land, and learning from the land is important. So what we have to do is to slow down, narrow down, and do things much more in depth but in a concept of preparing for a future. Whatever we do needs to be transferable. We need to be able to say, okay, whatever the issue is, social, environmental, or economic, what's the cause of it? What's the scope of it? Who are the winners? Why does it perpetuate? What would be an alternative to this? Who would be the new winners? What would the current winners likely push back? And what would be the interrelated, if you do something in an in, uh, in environment, what, is, what would be the impact on poverty in, in other parts of the world? You know, so it's that way of critical thinking, which brings us back, and I'll close with the idea, that much of what we're trying to do is totally linked in with critical thinking. It, it is about educating for the 21st century, the skills and so on that are there. And so integrating everything we do in education for sustainable development and environmental education and, and the other adjectival educations need to be wrapped in a concept of preparing people for our future and let's hope it's a sustainable one, or at least more sustainable than it is right now. Chuck, I'd like to ask you, what is the goal, or what are the goals of education? Mm. Well, that's, that's, of course, very, very complex. It depends on what country you're in. You know, it could, religion could play a large part. It depends on who in society you ask. If you were to ask a teacher, if there were a primary school teacher, you would get one answer. If you were to ask a university professor, it probably would be something different again. If you ask a grandparent, if you ask a parent, if you ask the student, uh, many, many different aspects, all the way from, uh, I just want them to have a better life than I've had, uh, through to prepare uh, to thrive in, in, uh, in an unknown future. You know, so, uh, or to become a, a more knowledgeable workforce so that uh, we can enhance the gross domestic product of our country. 
Usually it, something is written in the beginning of a curriculum guide, you know, in the way of purpose. Unfortunately, most people don't read the beginnings of the curriculum guide. They get narrowed down, okay, what, what do we do in, in uh, this part of the social studies course in this particular grade? Yeah, it's extremely important that we ask that question because once we know and understand the purpose, why are we educating people? Then what they should know, how it should be taught, what, um, what is the overall um, perspective, uh, what are the values that, that would be infused into uh, the education, um, what experience should they have, how do you build that compassion? All of that would sort of fall into place because right now so much of education is driven by marks in mathematics, language, uh, science, and in some countries religion and so on. These, as I say, are, are tools and they're extremely important and they should be as sharp as possible but we have to keep our vision on what is the purpose. What are we going to use these tools for and what are we going to construct? Not only in the individual, but in society as a whole. And I'm saying that one of the purposes should be a more sustainable future. That, that has to be there so that teachers at all, uh, all grade levels, uh, faculty of education can take their particular part and, and uh, build it in. What do you think about the quality of education? Is this something beyond <laughs> school completion rates and literacy and numeracy? What is quality education? <laughs> uh, just to, as an aside, we did some research uh, looking at could education for sustainable development, the content and how it is taught and all this kind of thing, could this improve the education of indigenous youth? Okay. Because we, we did the research with uh, the impact of ESD on quality education in 16 of, of the high performing PISA countries, you know, PISA, the, uh, uh, the program for international student assessment, right? And, uh, <clears throat> It came out that it really rounded out education, it was glowing, it did not hurt their math and language, you know, all that kind of, but gave them more run. So we thought, okay, let's go from the most successful education in, in the country to those who are the least well served by their education. And so we, we worked in uh, uh, 28 countries with uh, researchers and indigenous. But the first thing was to find out what did indigenous people feel was quality education. You know, and, and so we asked students, but we asked teachers, we asked parents, we asked the elders, and we asked the Ministry of Education. And of course it came out fairly, fairly differently as to uh, what really was quality. So once again, it, it, it's that, that aspect of uh, preparing f for a future, preparing for the well-being of the future, um, the values and culture that underlie it, and, and then then it got into another layer about uh, infrastructure, about who were who were the teachers. You know, it, it could, globally, teachers are not really they're undervalued. Let's let's put it that way. They're undervalued, underpaid, uh, often a lack of respect. I, I, I spent some time with a teacher from Togo who he drove, um, uh, he, he taught a couple of hours whenever he could in order to get gas money for his motorbike because he was a motorbike taxi driver. That was his real profession because he wasn't making enough out of teaching. Uh, in another case, I, I opened, I have my name on a building in Nigeria and it's a two-hole toilet. This 
school of 500 had no toilets. And finally, <laughs> they raised the funds to build a toilet. And I was invited to do the opening. <laughs> I mean, uh, at first, you it, it, it's kind of humorous when I tell the story about my name being on this toilet building in, in Nigeria. But the seriousness of the infrastructure and, and what that meant, it meant that girls could now attend school as they got a bit older. Menstruation came on and so on. It, it was a profound change. In others, it's the amount of, uh, of technical equipment, IT, you know, the, how can you actually have global competitiveness in trade and all, all of this kind of thing where this is such an unequal education, the preparation. That's why a key element that is often overlooked that is not in any of the adjectival educations, outdoor environmental development piece or whatever, about access and retention in quality education is there. And so that question about what is quality is something that local people have to develop and design. What do they want? That's why I think in many countries, education is a state or provincial or more local level, but not to the extreme of where a, a small handful of people uh, can control things. There, there needs to be some sort of global standards. Mm -hmm. And now while we try to understand different concepts, so going from education to sustainability, what is sustainability? Well, I think there's uh, different ways of looking at sustainability. We have the, sort of the general concept. That's all we could come up with that we could get world leaders to, to agree upon. And not just the world leaders, but different sectors in society. As I say, the, the private sector, faith-based groups, uh, politicians, uh, what they could sell to the general public. And so the concept of sustainable development moves along. There are some, some lovely ones. I, I love the definition of, uh, of an African elder, um, simply summed it up as enough for all forever. Enough for all forever. And what a discussion you can have on what is enough. What is enough? And for all, coming from an indigenous elder, you know, he wasn't just talking about his tribe or the people of South Africa, the people of Africa, people. He included all life, for all and forever, that intergenerational concept. I, I, I've switched it a little bit in, in my lectures to take in more of a Scandinavian concept of well-being for all, forever, but the for all still including all life. You know? and, and then the complexity of, of uh, what is well-being uh, beyond being well off, but, uh, that, that bigger construct of, of uh, well-being then what is well-being? Well, there's a lot of work that's going into trying to construct well-being. Uh, and it, it's one thing to come up with the concept of well-being, it's another to have that concept accepted in, in society as a whole, because usually it means a shift. And how do you bring about that, that kind of, of, of a shift? In some cultures, well-being is uh, it's about things possessions. And in other cultures, it's about experiences. You know, if I, if I were to go to extremes in North America, we, um, we want to uh, look at things, I mean, how many automobiles do you have, uh, what do you collect, um, the, the size of your house, uh, that kind of thing. In, uh, and home ownership is extremely important as a status symbol. In other cultures, it's more about experiences. It's interesting that there is a difference between 
income, the basic income that you need, and then you have some kind of income above that that is disposable. And how you choose to spend that disposable income. Is it on things? Is it on experience? Uh, you know, what, what, the arts? Or, uh, you, you know, that, that kind of thing. That uh, all uh, sort of goes into this concept of constructing your own sense of well-being. If I were to go to the other extreme, the, mo the most prized possession that um, uh, many indigenous people have in Australia is their story. It, and they don't share it with, with others. It is their prized possession. Who knows their story? What is the environmental footprint of a story? If we take it into our culture, um, a, a $50,000 uh, boat and its operation, a $50,000 piece of art. But the, this thing of trying to come up with cultural well-being and then getting society to accept that and, and, and say, yes, this is, this is what I really want. These are, are questions that are, are important, every bit is important for sociologists, psychologists, philosophers, and so on, to be a part of the sustainability and education for sustainability discussion that is there. How do we engage and bring people in who don't see themselves as, as part of it? It's a, a huge challenge, for you, but it's important that we, we, uh, we look at this. No one owns this. Everybody, though, can contribute. It's how do we move to bring these contributions together and then act on what we feel should be done out of that. For many, the idea of sustainability has a connotation of perpetual growth associated with it. And I, I wonder how education for sustainability reflects the idea of degrowth and promoting human well-being without increasing consumption. <laughs> an easy question. Yeah, what, once again, uh, I wish I had an answer. I have thoughts. <laughs> yeah. I think um, you mentioned the definition of of sustain, uh, sustainability or sustainable development by an African elder of uh, enough for all forever. Enough. What, what a great, you know, what is enough? And what does for all mean? You know, not limited to humans. And that intergenerational responsibility of, of uh, forever. Uh, Daniel Quinn in his books, uh, he has a series, Ishmael, My Ishmael, and the story of B, which is the story of what happens to a person who goes out trying to talk about simplicity and, and to engage other people and bring them together. Daniel Quinn's uh, first book in Ishmael, it, it, it categorizes civilizations as takers and leavers. And, and uh, uh, I heard him speak in Vancouver. He, he moved me uh, uh, greatly in, in deeper philosophical questions. I don't see sustainability as, as growth. And I think those of us who were working on it didn't see it as, as, as growth. Uh, if it was growth, it was growth that was qualified by its impact growth that was uh, it, its use, development in medicines and so on, okay? And it's developed by its availability to people uh, in, in, in all settings. The, the, the term, you know, I've been around to the, the very beginnings of the whole concept of sustainable development and, 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 and engaged, really, in the 80s through to now. 
at the beginning, the people who were really critical were largely environmentalists who were against the word development, you know, developers. And, and their first response was uh, much more along the lines of, of uh, well, it's an oxymoron. You, you know, you can't have sustainable growth. But they used the word growth. They didn't use the word development. And nor did they engage in an alternative. How do we address that 80% of the world's population that needed development? They needed to address hunger. They needed to address poverty, public health, education. They needed that, but there wasn't an alternative put forward in coming up with a, um, a, a new vision. And instead, they actually, it hurt things by bringing forward the idea that what we really needed was to cut back, give up, impose taxes. It was a whole negative concept instead of trying to say, okay, let's dig in and come up with a better vision. Of, uh, and what are we actually going to do to address the social, environmental, and, and uh, economic uh, uh, issues that are there. So it, an economist, uh, Peter Victor, um, he, he wants us to get together and he uses the term um, with it, uh, growing with design and not disaster. You know, where we actually come together and talk and, and, and try to figure out a just and equitable way forward. Now, uh, the Scandinavian countries, I think the last I looked at were 18 very high performing countries in, in, uh, that had developed and, and were thriving ec economically, but had tremendously cut back on greenhouse gas to, uh, uh, emissions and were, were rapidly moving in the right way. And it did not hurt them. At, or the or the people who lived in them, um, you know, for trying to move towards that way of uh, developing sustainably. So it's it's hard. I don't think the term um, degrowing will help, or degrowth will help politicians in trying to to engage people in moving to the to the windshield as opposed to the rear view mirror. What are your thoughts on whether education for sustainability in terms of goals, content, evaluation, whether that should be universal for everyone or localized? Well, my, I'm glad you, you don't say what are the answers or, you know, that's a, your thoughts, right? And, and uh, that's uh, that, that's very important. Right now, I'm I'm thinking that there uh, there should be some ultimate goals and um, uh, ways of thinking. Some important bits of of knowledge and information is kind of universal. You know, I really do. But who's you know. <laughs> Uh, when you start uh, uh, quizzing the role of humanity in relationship to other life forms and so on, the, the last thing we need is one religious perspective over top of that. We have a, a, a goal of trying to come up with a sustainable, equitable future for all life forms. So uh, an overarching goal. But how do we get there? Uh, and I think that's where we need to maintain the, the plurality. I, I see uh, teachers and uh, non-government organizations, all of these collaborating globally, talking with one another, getting ideas and so on. I see youth now with the telecommunications, Zoom and you know, Teams and blue jeans and whatever. There are so many ways in which young people can talk about their particular issues and, um, and, and address them. But overall, we need, it, it has to be encapsulated in what is locally relevant, uh, what's culturally appropriate, 
and what's meaningful in that setting. So uh, there have been a number of attempts of coming up with a global curriculum that everyone should be taught, and they really don't go very far. Um, because this this has to be put in in, uh, in a meaningful uh, perspective. So uh, yes, we have international initiatives, which is important, but they have to be developed and put in local context. I, that's my thoughts anyway. What keeps the world from investing much more into education? Uh, I think there are two big things that per, that keeps us for, or, or that determines our education. One is the amount of money we have. For many countries in the world, especially in Africa, 30% of their tax money goes into education. Whereas in North America, it's around two or three percent of GDP or goes into education. You know? So it's how much will the general population support is, is the other one. Who, who wants to pay taxes? Those are, are sort of the two. How, how much is there that can be put into education? And the other is the perception of the general public uh, as to how much they, they will put into it. So politicians, you know, they're driven in a democracy, not by the goal of delivering good governance. They're driven by staying in power. And so that big determinant is there as to how much is downloaded on the general public in the way of taxation or other forms of, 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 of public policy. I don't care, it doesn't just be taxation. But politicians need to build the public support to stay in power, right? So that's why the third aspect, remember I talked about there are four thrusts, access and retention, public education, reorienting the purpose. Third is public awareness and understanding is a key element that most of us who are working in the field don't value or put in there enough. That's where the non-formal education is crucial. Non-formal and informal education. This is the aspect that builds the public support that will allow us to make the kinds of progress. Even what we teach in the school has to, has to have some kind of public support, or at least not the anger of the general public. So that's the, these things all work together. And then the fourth being training. So we can, we can train not just teachers, but our education leaders, the people in the Ministry of Education, right? I mean, these have their, their concepts as well. And the, the, not only the training, the discussion, and learning our way forward is crucial. And so now we're working with... Uh, UNITAR, the United Nations Training Group. It, it, it's important in taking on the role, because being the UN, they can they sort of have access to senior leaders. I mean, who's going to stand up in the United States and say, I'd like to train all the university leaders? Right? So what we're working now with, through uh, a joint program, UNESCO and UNITAR, is how can we support this transformation that is being called for uh, uh, by the UN Secretary General and by nations. It's not just the UN calling it. This is a concerted thing uh, the coming from world leaders that if we are going to have a more sustainable future, key to it is, uh, is the idea of engaging education. The only thing that has been agreed upon by the UN General Assembly as the key enabler of all of the sustainable development goals on three occasions, 2017, 19, and 21, is education for sustainable development. It's the only thing that is the key enabler 
of it all, not just education, but education for sustainable development that includes not only access and so on, but the reorienting of the purpose of education. It's interesting that in many countries, teachers go through very rigorous certification, teacher preparation, but as you mentioned, the leaders in education or elected politicians don't go through any learning or standards or like how to be a good politician, how to be a good uh, decision maker for the, to deliver good governance. Mm. So do you think that we should implement systems that test, certify and teach those elected officials? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. I think uh, oftentimes the only training they have is in, in the legality. You know, as, as I uh, moved uh, in, into becoming certified as a school superintendent, it was, it was largely around the legalities and uh, what, to, what to avoid and how to, how to, uh, how to bring about change. But yeah, no, this, these bigger discussions about what is quality education, why are we educating people, what, what is the purpose of education, uh, inclusivity of, of all, you know, these kinds of questions we never seem to have time for. At the heart of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development are 17 Sustainable Development Goals. After 2030, which values or goals do you think will guide our actions if we'd like to move to a more sustainable future? Most of the goals that have been identified now will remain there. We, we, most, um, I think we, we've made progress in about 15%. So 85%. <laughs> It still remains in our in worse situation. Uh, about 30% of the goals have gone backwards, not even remain the same. So we need to get more serious. So I think that most of this there will be repackaged, but some may be added around culture. For instance, culture is just isn't there. But at some point, we need to address the underpinnings of how we live and, and new forms of well-being. And that, that will depend a lot on, on how do we address culture. The idea of shifting from the utopian sustainable future to include the climate change concept of prevention, mitigation, adaptation. We have to get far more serious about adaptation. When we realize that the current generation just is not that able to look after future generations. For whatever reason, for most, it's poverty. They're, they're trying to survive, but for 10% of the population, it's just a decision they've made. Either they feel hopeless or it's too big a gap. Uh, many feel, well, it's impossible anyway. I may as well party till the lights go out. Uh, and we need to reframe how we're talking about it. You know, sustainability has such a negative context. Most people, if you talk about sustainable development, you know, it's like saying you're, you're going to have to give some things up. It's not about setting new values and aspirations to go to that you really want to be there. It's about giving up your existing ones. It's, you know, if Martin Luther King had stood up and said, I have a nightmare, you know, and uh, he probably wouldn't have had the support that I have a dream. It, it, so they, we need to, to talk about it in, 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 a, in a much different way. So after 2030, and that discussion is already beginning because it takes four or five years to negotiate what, what world leaders will agree upon. So yeah, I think most of what we're addressing now will remain. 
maybe repackaged. But we've had such great recognition around the concept of sustainable development goals. We had almost zero around Agenda 21. We, in Europe, they, it was pickup. It was all about local Agenda 21s. How do you bring these global goals down and localize them and bring them into the hearts of everyday living? That's a whole different story. Uh, so most will remain, maybe a few new ones, such as uh, adaptation and resilience as a concept through the goals. And new goals, perhaps we'll be able to deal with population. Perhaps we'll be able to deal with culture. Uh, so there will be, uh, be some new ones, I think. And do you think that in the future, thinking about sustainability, will care a little bit more about nature for its own sake as well? Yeah, I, I think that's going to be a huge leap maybe in the future, to say, who are we on the planet as humans and our relationship to the rest of life on, on the planet? Now, that's fundamentally a religious and philosophical construct that, uh, that I think we, we do have to, to, to deal with if we really are going to have a more sustainable future. There is a great deal of arrogance that is built into even the feeling that we, the concept of sustainable development, that we really can guide and, 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 uh, and, and um, manage the world. Try managing some of the storms and some of the natural disasters that we are causing and so on. But that, that fundamental question of are we simply a part, another species on the planet with an attribute of being able to think and being able to forecast as well as look back? You know, we don't think most other, uh, other animals uh, can forecast as so much into the future or know that much about the past. But you take a monarch butterfly, we can't even find where the brain is, and yet that monarch butterfly that is born out here in my garden knows how to find a certain tree in a part of, Me of Mexico to get back to this fall. There's so many things we really don't know and, and understand. So to set ourselves up apart to rule the world and to manage the world, is, as I say, is pretty arrogant and something we do need to think about. And then what's about our connection to distant future generations? Why would people today care about well-being of people who will inhabit this place 200 years later? Yeah, humans, we have a terrible time dealing with scales. Uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, I can't even, when I ask most people, uh, what, how big is a ton of, of, of CO2, you know, greenhouse gas? We, we talk about tons of it. We, we can't envision it. We, we can't envision a trillion dollars that we're putting in to stimulate something. What would, what would a trillion dollars look like? Um, the wildfires fires in British Columbia this year are destroying a, um, 22 million hectares. So what does that mean? Well, it means the size of Belgium. The idea of forecasting generated, you know, at, at, at the millennium back in 2000, I, we're talking in part of my lectures would have been, yeah, we just need to figure out to get another thousand years out of the planet. Try and envision the planet a thousand years from now. How about three generations? the year 2050 when our children in elementary school now will be living. Envision the planet in 2050 and what will it be like and what's my responsibility as an individual? For some of us, we can take that seriously. For a large part of the world, the global inequities that exist means that they're surviving. Well, how are they going to manage to the end of the week? You know? And so how do we address these kinds of social injustices 
and economic injustices so we can ad address the environmental injustices. That's where the concept of sustainable development, that's where we're trying to head. We're not doing a very good job on it, but it's, it's the best idea that we have at the moment that people around the world, our world leaders, agree upon and use it as an underlying basis. As they say, it's terribly flawed, but it's the best we have. So we need, we need to work with it. And where we really need to get people thinking, especially in higher education, is how do we improve it? What's after sustainable development? How can we improve? How, how can we address the injustices, critically thinking and planning and so on, and, and move forward? We need to criticize sustainable development greatly, and, but from a, a critical analysis and how do we improve on it? Not to throw it away for nothing, but what are we going to build that is better? That's, that's crucial. And what can we do uh, as educators to criticize and to transform the normative paradigm of education that prioritizes economic growth above planetary health and social and individual well-being? Mm. Well, I, I think, first of all, we, it, it, we don't have a better model. This is one of the great problems with sustainability. We're, we're, we're driving the sustainability bus by looking in the rearview mirror. We, we know what we're trying to move away from as opposed to where we're going. We can't envision, really, a sustainable future. We know now what are the things we need to stop doing, what are the things we need to to modify and change. What are the things that are okay? It's sort of like the stoplight at the back of the bus, you know, the red, the, the amber, and, and, and the green. What do we need to start doing? So the realism in addressing the economy and, and, and the word development is to, first of all, accept the world needs an economy. I mean, that, that's another word for trade. Right? And, I can't build an automobile. I have to do something in order, now that's saying I need a form of transportation, let's put it that way. And there are times, yes, when I do go on a plane, I have to justify is the handprint, you know, is that my trip, the handprint that comes out of it bigger than the footprint of taking the trip. Okay? So we do need an economy, but what do we build it on? The concept of development, I just think much of what we're doing, think of the Model A as a, the first automobile, the emissions from that, you could smell them 100 yards away, okay? And the, the emissions from an electric vehicle. So the, the idea of development that is aligned with reducing the ecological footprint addressing the social justice and who gets access to that development, you know, and the economic uh, development that comes out, the economic underlying justice of decent work and preparing it and so on. So driving susta a sustainable future as a goal, not only in education, but as a goal of life of humans on, on, on the planet is important. And so we, if we learn to steer the economy along that line of reducing footprint and enhancing handprint, that is a start that I think we could get people to buy into. Because remember, coming up with a whole different pattern and trying to market it, no, we, and we need to move now. So we need to start with incremental shifts that people will buy into and then uh, have the discussions where the society wants to move further. When we first come out with the idea of collection of, of uh, garden waste and uh, for recycling here in, 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 and food scraps from the kitchen and, and separating them out and, and collecting them in this, uh, from, through the municipality, 
they decided to run a little part of it as a pilot project. The whole city said, no, we want it too, you know, we, and it has taken off and it's really gone. So the separation of garbage and all the rest of it really went. If people see that it's useful, um, uh, I think in their heart, there is a value in wanting to look after future generations. But we have to address the impediments. You know, with public transportation, we have to rethink, make it convenient. In Europe, public transportation is the way to go. You know, and so we need to, to address well, what's holding it back, how do we do it, and, and so forth. Education for sustainability has benefited from better understandings of science and economy. In your view, what's the role of culture, of art, of traditions in defining education for sustainability? Yeah, yeah. Well, ultimately, again, what we want is informed, knowledgeable action. So the natural sciences, the physical sciences are great in, in supplying that basic understanding and what really is happening and, and delving into it. But information doesn't necessarily lead to, uh, to action. So basically, what we need to, as well as the natural and physical sciences, we need to engage in the social sciences, the psychology, the philosophy, um, political science, sociology. They have a very, very important role to play in that. And in it, of course, um, the arts are so important. It's, a visual can engage us much, uh, engage us far beyond a hundred pages of uh, of a journal. Right? Uh, you know, we have to we have to uh, to be realistic. The stories that are part of of one's culture. Let me give an example. I, I was visiting a, a, a school for indigenous youth in the mountains of, of Taiwan. And as I went up to the entrance of the school, there were two pillars. On one pillar was a, a big black bird, a mold, a sculpture on top of it. And on the other one was a toad. And so as I went in, I, I, uh, I was talking with the principal and I asked him and he said, well, it's best perhaps if one of our students, he said, I have a student who speaks some English. And she can explain it to you. So this young girl, I think she was a grade three or grade four, uh, took me out and stood me in front of them. She wanted the, the context. And she said, you know, when the, the blackbird originally was an extremely beautiful colored bird, but when humans came to earth, the animals felt sorry for them because they really couldn't do anything very well. And so they thought the greatest gift they could give them was the gift of fire, because that way they, they could preserve food and so on. So she said, the, this beautiful bird volunteered to go to the volcano and get some lava and put it in its beak. And it came back and it was, all blackened, it was burnt, the feathers, the bill was black and so on, but it was a sacrifice for humans. And the beautiful frog decided that it would do the same and it put some lava on its back and it burnt it and, and the blisters and everything on the toad, but it was a gift to humanity. And she said, you know, the animals have looked after humans for thousands and thousands of years. But now we don't look after the animals very well. And we must remember that. And, you know, that kind of uh, embedding of a concept through a story. So the visual, the performing arts, um, moving from uh, passive engagement. I mean, some of the, the movies that we see, they really stir things up. But if once we move to actually engaging, I know that 
when we did a huge review of curriculum here in Toronto, we found that it was one of the most important things we could do was to introduce more drama and dramatic arts because that really engaged people and it got them thinking of new alternatives, new ideas, changing perspective, exchanging roles and debate and so on. Because a, a bottom line is that, um, well, we really need to come up with a positive vision of where we're going. Right now, as I often say, we're driving by looking in the rear view mirror. What are we trying to get away? But we have to come up with a vision and a vision that is positive enough that our politicians can wrap it up and market it without fear of being thrown, thrown out of office. So I see really the arts is extremely important in all that. What advice would you give to real teachers today uh, to start shifting their programs and implement at least some aspects yeah. of education for sustainability? Right. I think realistically, we have to start with what I like to call the strengths model. It, you know, for years as, as a superintendent of the curriculum, <laughs> It was my goal to bring around professional development, which usually meant met meeting with teachers at the end of the day when they're really tired. We give them coffee and pizza, right? And then we tell them what they're doing wrong, and I have a better idea. I'm going to share my idea with you. Now we have a shared new vision, and we're going forward, right? And other than the one teacher who wanted to be promoted, it, it really did not make a great deal of difference. Right? So came upon me, we need to build the strengths model, consult with the teachers. First of all, no one discipline, subject, grade level owns the whole concept. Right? So it means that every teacher has something to contribute. What is your strength? Is it social justice? Is it inventing games in physical education that you know you could spread the idea of together is better than individual yet at the same time focus on individual contribution to something bigger you know is your strength language could you compose rap songs about about a social or environmental or an economic issue that you have Mathematics, can you address the idea of scale, you know, the, the, uh, the size, dimension, time, extremely large numbers, extremely small numbers. And when you're using examples, use the, the, the dimensions of, uh, uh, of global issues and so on. So, Whatever your discipline, what can you do to alter your, your teaching, your curriculum? Then the next step is how do you work with other teachers and leadership in the school to build this into sort of a comprehensive package? So you work out together what field trips will a student take during their time in that school? What is the underlying values and ethics that you want to portray? What is the brand of, of the school? You know, the purpose, get in, into that. How, how, does, how does the graduate of your school going to have the knowledge, skills, values, perspectives, and so on? to contribute so that their handprint will be greater than their footprint. And then from that, when you build it, look for the resources. And because and, uh, the change needs to be led up but resourced down. We, we have to, at the same time, become politically active. and and get the leadership on board, get parents behind so that the leadership feels comfortable and safe 
and, you know, and, and moving. And slowly we construct this little snowball that can go for it. But it all starts with an individual teacher's strength and, uh, and then building with others and bringing about that kind of change. And when better models are there, other people will be attracted and it'll start to move. And we have many good models around the world. There are, teachers are not alone. There are hundreds of thousands of teachers who want to move on this because in their heart they know it, it is the right thing to do and, and, and do want to, uh, to move. And then going from formal school-based education to non-formal settings, what are special strengths of community-based non-formal uh, spaces yeah. uh, of education to promote learning for sustainability? Yeah, we talk about a whole school <laughs> approach. It's a whole community approach uh, that we also uh, that we also need. I remember when around the year 2000 and, and we started thinking about uh, the UN decade of education for sustainable development and which ran from 2005 to 2014 but it, like everything we started preparing for it in 2002 to bring it in and, and as many good things start over a uh, over a beer the rector of the United Nations University and I were talking about the disappointment we had in the progress that was being made by, by countries negotiating. We'll give up this, you give up that, and so on. We said, gee, if we worked at the local level, you're not negotiating, you're, not getting, you're just coming together to, to build a more sustainable community. And if, you, if we could bring together the sustainable development communities, now suddenly you have a region and then, you know, and, and build. And so the idea was what would be university's contribution, being the rector of the United Nations University. And so the idea emerged of uh, building, bringing together two big groups. One group being the, the educators, the influencers in the community formal education, non-formal education, informal education. Okay? So it would be the university, yes, but school systems, uh, the NGOs, whether they were social or environmental NGOs, etc. Uh, zoos, botanical gardens, uh, you know, these, these people who have message, faith-based groups, extremely important. So this, this collection, together with the people who know what are the sustainability issues in your community now and what's likely to come. So whether it is researchers, uh, urban planners, the private sector, whatever, the people who know, how do you get that up-to-date, local, relevant information into the hands of these who are the educators in the community. How do you bring them together to try and bring relevant, you know, locally appropriate uh, uh, knowledge and, and facilitate engagement? Remember, we, it's just telling them isn't, isn't enough. We need to, to tell them, engage, and do something. Become empowered. Give them the skills of, of how do you actually lobby? How do you, how do you bring about change at the community level? This is important. And so we, we started with seven around the world, uh, what we call regional centers of expertise in education for sustainable development. I, and now I believe there are 183 of, of these around the world. And where people come together, they are still in an initial uh, concept. Uh, usually they are not well funded, but they are clusters of people who come together, build relationships, a common vision of a more sustainable community, and pool their talent, their sometimes resources, and, and come up with a collective message that the general public 
and students that they hear this united message. So they don't just hear it in the classroom and it's for the exam. No, this is what they live, they feel. They hear this message forever and they have the feeling that they can actually do something about it. it, it it's a, a beautiful concept because one of the biggest hurdles to overcome is how do we localize the SDGs? How do we take these big global concepts that are negotiated and bring it down into tangible things that a teacher or a non-government organization, a worker in a field study center in a zoo can do different on Monday morning? That, that's what we need to, to work on and do it wherever we can collectively and make our handprints bigger than our footprints. It seems like states are pretty dysfunctional in promoting sustainability. And do you think that we should delegate more power and decision making to cities, neighborhoods, non-profit mm. associations or regional centers of expertise mm. and this civil society in deciding where to allocate resources, mm. how to transform education? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, I think the, the, the real uh, um, contribution of the regional centers of expertise is in building public understanding and awareness, whether it's through students really learning and influencing parents and, and, and forming their own values. What am I going to do you know, in, in the rest of my life? And so... Remember, the, these centers, um, they are not going to undertake changing sewage treatment plants and, uh, you know, the, the hard, they're, they're the soft influencers, the knowledge, the understanding, the building the awareness, hey, this, this is an, an issue that, uh, that is there. And then having them become, giving them the, as I say, the knowledge and skills to become community act, uh, active in their community. How do, how do you come together? How do you lobby? And then turn it over to those with the expertise of actually bringing about the change. But at least the regional centers of expertise sound the awareness, build the understanding, and create the momentum for change. That, that's important. It's the, it, again, is a key enabler in bringing about the building of more sustainable communities, is that initial stage of awareness, public awareness, understanding, and, and, uh, and, and building the, the, uh, the groundswell of, of, um, of collaboration you just mentioned lobbying, which uh, this brings me to the idea of civic engagement and democracy. Do you think that these uh, ideas are crucial to promote sustainable future? And if so, mm. how, what is the role of education in promoting civic yeah. engagement and democracy? Part of, uh, of um, more recent developments is the, the uniting of education for sustainable development with global citizenship education. This has, is proving to be, I think, extremely important and very effective. So that if we look at education for sustainable development more from the, the knowledge uh, base, of building the, whether it's environmental uh, knowledge, and, you know, through, through whatever, through environmental education and, and so on, together with the concept of what do we do about it. So global citizenship education is two parts. The first part is building the compassion and the, and the willingness to engage. The feeling of, I should do something. Okay. Together with the second part is the skills of what do I do? How do we do it? How do, how do we bring about civic action? 
So if you have the knowledge, build the willingness and the compassion with the skills, that becomes much more of a package of being informed uh, and engaged citizens. That, that's sort of where we want to, to move towards. And that, 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 would be, uh, that would be a whole. And the nice thing, like from, from environmental education, we, we have the old triangle, to know, to care, to act. Okay, to know, to care, and to act. And it doesn't matter where you enter into the triangle. You, you know, it can be just take, going out and planting trees, it, you act, and then you become kind of hooked and you want to know a little bit more about. And then uh, over time, you, uh, you want to actually uh, um, become engaged. You, you care about this, this kind of thing. Well, the same as that, that triangle of, of the knowledge, the caring, and the acting that comes together with education for sustainable development and, and uh, global citizenship. But with the education for sustainable development based on social, environmental, and, and economic with the different adjectival educations that feed in and build upon the core discipline. Okay, that build upon math, language, history, geography, and so on. You know that the, 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 that access, and in the same way at the university, the, the, the sociology, the arts, architecture, engineering, and so on, changing the purpose and embedding it in there. The, these are our concepts of where we want to move to now. Given that sustainability is is not a goal but a process, what approaches or methods should we use to evaluate the success of education for sustainability in schools or and or non formal settings as well? Yeah, right now I'm focused a lot more on on quantity. You know, I I, I want to see how many faculties of education or teacher education institutions around the world are addressing sustainability in, in the preparation of new teachers. I want to see sustainability being key parts in schools of engineering, in schools of architecture, in, in business schools. I want to see in, in discussing this in, in philosophy. I want to see if it is embedded enough in elementary and secondary schools that not only is it a part of the examination in math, language, history, geography, but that the schools are actually ad addressing it. If they have lunchroom program, you know, what is reflected in, in eating locally and, and sustainably and so on. So I, I want to see that. The evaluation um, is difficult because it depends on, on your concept of what is ESD. But like many people really see ESD as, as an adjectival, you know, as sustainability education. That's where the vision is, and that's what they think we can actually achieve. And, and, and that's fine. Okay? And if you do, then you think of it as a subject, then you think of evaluation, reporting, monitoring, all that. I mean, UNESCO is into monitoring, evaluation. This is, uh, this is their, their thoughts. So if you look at it as an, an adjectival, you know, where you have to put something before the word education, peace education, driver education, whatever, then, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. When I was a school superintendent, I made a list of 80 of these adjectivals. And teachers would say, oh, God, don't come to me with more. I'm focusing, you know, on the core. But these adjectivals grow, and they're there, simply because it illustrates how inadequate the core curriculum is in preparing people for tomorrow. So it, it, it is really important. And uh, so, again, it's a, a strange answer, but at the moment, I'm more into, into quantity. Let's get it out there. And then let the educators and the learners 
uh, decide on on what is relevant, what what is meaningful, what really engages them to the point of action, what builds the compassion and, and the lifelong approach and and, uh, and uh, what is working. But I think at this point, we're, we're still, let's get it out there. Now, we do know uh, from research that ESD approaches, you know, seeing it as a purpose and embedded in the core and the adjectivals that are put together to suit that local education system. We do know from research in 18 of the high performing PISA countries, and as the other extreme from at least 50 settings of indigenous education, where the indigenous youth were so poorly being served by their education systems, that embedding ESD in there, not only did it not hurt the learning of math and language and history and so on, but it rounded out the education and, and parents, educators and the youth themselves felt that the content and the approaches that were used to link them with the land and with the urban setting and with one another and, and uh, that, that essence of doing something meaningful, not only for themselves, but for others, where others is more than humans. So that's where I think the role of ESD is in improving overall education quality. What is the role of universities to enable all people who get higher education, no matter which major, to become ambassadors of sustainability, yeah. no matter what career they pursue in the future? Well, more and more universities are rising up to their, their, a sense of responsibility. What's in it for the university is reputation. It, it's a sense of serving an importance to the community and to the future of the planet. Um, it's, um, it aligns with the, the overarching goals of, of universities in not only teaching and learning and, and but uh, community service and so on, but it, it, the recognition of the importance of universities being there at the sharp end of the of the spear, uh, you know, at the pointy end in trying to to create a more sustainable future with the ideas and, and the vision shaping as well as the knowledge, talent, and, and the values that, that build the shaft of, of the whole thing. Now, how do, we, how do we do it? So some universities are taking the approach that every graduate, uh, uh, anyone who attends, in the, the first year, the first two weeks at the university is teaching about a more sustainable future. So all of the professors or many of the professors are involved in that first two weeks of orientation or one week or two weeks. Other universities are trying to look at how professors can embed it the, the, the role of their particular discipline. What is, is it relevant at all towards creating a more sustainable future? How is it relevant? Okay, and what, uh, what should their students know, be able to do, and value enough to act upon when, when they graduate? And embed that into of their examinations and, and testing. In others, they go beyond just the teaching and try and bring purpose to their research of what are we contributing to a more sustainable future and report on that. What are their, what are their teaching, their contribution and so on. And others, as uh, say, are entering into ranking schemes with high, at times higher education and, um, uh, and Q uh, rankings uh, are, are bringing forward um, this uh, Sully test in, uh, coming out of France 
is uh, a ranking system where they go in and, and um, universities can apply this and see what their student, the shift in their students' knowledge and understanding across all the disciplines and faculties. So the, universities are, are moving and it's a great thing. Quality education is an important goal for any educator or teacher. So I'm thinking of quality education in terms of the sustainable development goals, mm -hmm. sustainable development goal four. In your view, are there one or two other SDGs, sustainable development goals that teachers should pay attention to today? And if you do think there are others, why do you think that? Well, the, the World Economic Forum, it, it, it's a great place to, uh, you know, listen in and so on. And each year they come up um, with their threats to the, you know, to, to the future. And uh, usually they do it as what's on us now and what's coming. So two years out, the current threats that are there that we really need to work on, uh, I look them up. And, and uh, so... Uh, currently, the cost of living, which is a social one, natural disasters, number two, the, the geopolitical confrontations, war and the, the separating into camps of, of, and clusters of countries and so on, and the erosion of social cohesion that left-right split and so on. That's on us right now. But they're saying 10 years out from now, the number one thing is going to be climate mitigation. You know, how do we lessen it? And then the second one is climate adaptation. What, what are we really going to do? The third one will continue to be natural disasters because climate change is enhancing fires and even earthquakes and so on with rising sea levels, etc. The fourth one is biodiversity loss. And the fifth one is large scale involuntary migration. So if I take that, then I would say that as well as SDG4, which has been recognized in the UN General Assembly as the key enabler of all the SDGs, I would think uh, SDG13 on climate change, uh, 15 on biodiversity, and both 6 and 14, 6 being freshwater, 14 being oceans and saltwater and so on. But the majority of the SDGs actually address social issues. And unless we can tell, we can address these social issues, we will not move society to engage with the environmental ones. They, they're they addressing poverty, hunger, poor health, um, no employment. You no know, equitable, well-paid employment. They're going to move the migration and so on. So I don't know which ones are really important. I think what we have to do is change our concept and and not look at this. Uh, you know, these seventeen goals, which really should be probably thirty, because there's so many that are there that. Um, there's some youth called uh, previously black holes in the sustainable development goals, you know, things that uh, countries just won't agree to. I think we have to look at them as um, a patchwork quilt. You know, each individual patch it, it doesn't really help you at night on the cold, uh, a cold evening. You have to have them all. And they're also interrelated. The collapse of the fisheries, it's environmental, but it's certainly also economic and it's social and it's the destruction of, of a way of life of, 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 uh, of those people. So we have to look at it in that uh, larger context. Those, those are my thoughts. It, it's, it's, it's hard to, to single them out. Jack, how would you describe your legacy, your main contribution to the field of education mm -hmm. or to the field of sustainability? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I'll have any, uh, any real legacy or contribution. I guess what I, I try to do is to maintain the breadth 
of what it is and not let it slip into some little thing that we add on. I keep the dream alive of actually transforming education uh, to, to include a sustainable future as part of the overarching concept of education, public awareness and training. I was deeply inspired myself with the story of, in 2004 in Hyderabad in India, an NGO was teaching about the ecological footprint. And this little girl in, in grade four, she said, but I have hands. I can do something about my footprint, which was minuscule compared to, you know, ours. Uh, so they painted the hands and the kids put hands on paper like happens in every other, you know, classrooms around the world. But that teacher didn't leave it there. The teacher recognized the power of the metaphor of the ecological handprint being like a positive antidote to the footprint. And she went to a non-government organization, the Center for Environmental Education in India. They built on it and started a campaign and they took it to the Ministry of Environment in India, which led to a train traveling around India, bringing school groups together and it built. And from there, the concept spread through Africa. It spread into Europe. And wherever I go, I, I talk about the ecological handprint as a personal way, because all of us have an environmental or ecological backpack we carry with us. You know, it, it, we try to guide our lives. It's almost a sense of guilt. But a way of overcoming that is ensuring that our handprints are significant. And so I, I live my life trying to build on my strength. My, my only real strength is education and talking with people and sharing ideas, the great ideas from India to China to here and there. And, uh, sort of spreading things around. Uh, my legacy, uh, hopefully, will be one of uh, sharing ideas, concepts, sometimes poking the bear. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you, you, have to, you have to prod people who have resources and power and so on and, and do what you can to change their trajectory a little bit. Not immediately, no one changes immediately, but you try and infect them with an incurable form of sustainability. Chuck, can you recommend some books that uh, inform your thinking, books that you like, or books that you would recommend to educators to enlighten their thinking? <laughs> uh, Alex, I think the, uh, the easiest way is to come with me to my office and, and let me just pick out a couple. You know, at different stages in one's life, different things have affected you and changed you and so on. But there are a couple of books I keep close. Sure. Let me pick out a few. Gosh, it's so difficult. At, at the heart, you know, one has to, uh, to think of David Orr and, and his works. Uh, David has been so thoughtful and bringing this uh, bringing forward the importance of, of uh, environmental education in, and in, in the larger picture. The, uh, if I were to, to look though from learning as a whole, I think another truly important one is, is the Dolores Report, which questions, this came out in 1996, and you know, about every 25 years, UNESCO holds a huge commission on what is the purpose of education. And this is the one that so shaped my thinking with four purposes. One is to know, one is to do, one is to learn to become. What can, you, what can we become? And then the fourth is to live together. And so this form shaped me into the changing to today. What do we not know in the to know, you know, because we can't know everything. 
and what it's important what we don't know to do is uh, that uh, what are the values and ethics underneath doing and then the um, to become at whose expense and it's not just the individual becoming but what will society become and to learn to live together with others sustainably and figure out who are the others and does that also include beyond people you know so that that's important so this is a great a great book that really uh, really shaped me now another one of course that shapes me is uh, the Brundtland report our, our common future this is the is sort of the Bible for defining sustainable development, the range of it. And in the very preface, it talks about the importance of teachers and that we're not going to move forward without it. In Agenda 21, which uh, is not a, a, a book, but I, I have several uh, uh, in, uh, copies uh, around it, Education, public awareness, and training is mentioned throughout the the entire uh, uh, book. Uh, originally, with uh, the first uh, uh, implementation plan, forty chapters, and education or understanding knowledge is mentioned in in all forty of, of the chapters. So it it's uh, it, it's essential. Now we can take a a different approach. This is. <laughs> The saber-tooth curriculum. This is a parody of back in the Stone Age, where they are trying to change the curriculum uh, to a curriculum that actually worked because of the the uh, the onslaught of the Ice Age and what was changing, and uh, the poor people who brought forward this new curriculum. Uh, we're put to death because we always have done it this way. It, it, it was a great one that affected me into how does one actually bring about change? And then you have great people who think a lot about global issues. Vandana Shiva, uh, her work, I think everyone should have. The, uh, the uh, of course, Small is Beautiful, Schumacher, bringing forward the idea of, um, you know, but one has to also look at, while small is beautiful, is there a way of scaling up to be effective? I, I can bring about change in my own school. When I was a school principal, I did wonderful things, but how do you scale it up? I had my student, for instance, I took my grades six, seven, and eight, we flew to the high Arctic, and we lived with indigenous people, <laughs> and it changed the lives of my students. But how do you scale up? So small is, is beautiful, is a wonderful one. If we want to get into different cultures, you have Vandana Shiva in India, in the United States, the work of Aldo Leopold, the San County Almanac and that slowing down and learning to look. Learning, when you look at a tree, you don't just see a tree, but you see the texture of the bark. You see movement in amongst the bark with the small insects and so on. The change of the seasons, you know, that sort of thing. Right now, the hawk migration is on uh, and uh, moving over us, and I hope we have a look at that. The Power of Living on the Land, The Songs of a Sourdough. This is a, a Robert Service, a, a book of poetry that is so visual, the harshness of living in, in the, the far north. I have um, a fascination, I think, with, with uh, indigeneity and learning to listen and, and, to, and uh, stories and so on. So another book that really shaped me, ah, this, this old one, it's kind of falling apart, but I picked up in a bookstore, it, it, I almost have to handle it. But Peter Freuken, a, a Dane, a Danish explorer, who uh, in the late 1800s, he uh, crossed Greenland, 
and made it into Canada and made it across to Alaska and back walking. And it's an adventure, a solo trip with dog teams and, and what happened to him, the idea of perseverance and so on. Because the, a lot of the things that I was able to accomplish in, in, um, in getting a, a field study center built and so on, the first outdoor education center, it, it took us roughly 15 years to get it approved, to get it built, the concept. The second one only took seven. <laughs> so you, you, you learn the idea of that change is slow. The first time you'll be turned down, you go looking for something, you ask, you're turned down. You need perseverance. And then things that come out, for instance, here's the chapter uh, from the UN on education, public awareness and changing. The uh, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 36 printed out. And then on the back was the, the, the first work program that was put out uh, by the United Nations Commission on Sustainable Development. And in that work commission is addressing teachers. How do we build the concept of education for sustainable development? How do we move forward? And we're still struggling with that now. It's complex because education itself is, is complex. And you know, education is one of the few in the world, few institutions for which there's no real built-in product renewal. <laughs> Imagine if we were in the private sector and we had no real money for research and development or, or training of employees or changing of models and so on. It, it's sort of serendipity, it kind of happens and so on. You know, but now, we really do need a major retooling that is led by educators but with with engagement with society because we have to as we move bring along public and and support difficult but it needs to be done okay and just uh oh, a, a couple more uh, if we're talking about key writers, I think everyone should read something from Stephen Sterling, where I disagree with the title where he calls it about, uh, well, at least he calls it sustainable ed education. This is an early work, but uh, it's about revisioning learning and change. And Stephen really grasps the big, the big picture. Uh, and at the heart of it, of course, without an environment, you don't have a society and you don't have an economy. So, you know, one, some parts are, are bigger than other in the balancing. But I truly respect reading what Stephen is saying. And then if we go to the other extreme, you know, Agenda 21 was the first implementation plan. And so this is a children's version of Agenda 21 that was put together by youth uh, in, uh, in England. And in it, it, ad it addresses the 40 chapters, but it also talks about the kinds of things that weren't in there, that world leaders omitted. The whole thing around population is not addressed because world leaders could not agree upon it and so on. So it's called Rescue Mission, Planet Earth, and it's a children's edition of Agenda for the 21st Century. I was so impressed with this that uh, I was able to raise the funds um, uh, to get a copy of this book and put in every school across Canada uh, for young people to read and to become inspired. Uh, for instance, this is the whole thing on the black holes <laughs> in Agenda 21. The war and militarism is not there. Governance is not there. Discrimination and nationalism. You know, we are the best. You know, that, that kind of nonsense in the world. Whole thing around birth control. Totally missing. You know, we were talking about what are the kinds of things that uh, may be in, in the 2030 Agenda but the whole thing around human rights uh, and uh, refugees, forced migration, 
Oh, things that are too touchy, huh? Eh? So the children found that. And, and, and young people are saying, hey, these are the kinds of things that, uh, that, uh, that we need in the, in the next one. So these are the kinds of things I think that uh, one, one should kind of surround oneself, not be overwhelmed by it, but to remember to shape as you set priorities and for what you want to do and what you can do. Some of us have access you know, to power or to, or to decision makers. Some of us have, are simply leaders by example, what we do in our own classroom on our next field trip. The next group we, we take it through our nature center, whatever it is, we do the best we can with what we've got and who we have access to. So as a community of educators and teachers around the world, are we winning or losing the battle? <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's what counts, right? Do we get an A or a C, <laughs> right? And, and um, we are winning. It, it is so slow. It's painful. It, it is painful, but we, we are winning. Today, there are more educators, not only formal, but non-formal, informal, groups forming, NGOs, school systems, all the way from preschool to universities that are recognizing it and becoming engaged. So we've got an awful lot more to do, but of all the 17 sustainable development goals, education is the one that is, is moving. Are there millions without access to school? Yes but it's shrinking, right? Are there teachers around the world that have not heard of education for sustainable development or environmental education? Yes, but more have, every day, more. And they, the curriculum is being shifted in, in more places. And professional development is growing Faculties of education are now adding. Oh, we're over 50% of the faculties of education around the world are now talking about it. So, we are winning. We're not alone. It's, uh, it, it is a positive thing.